Christian Parenting. Welcome to the Christian Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Steph Thurling. I'm the Executive Director of Christian Parenting, a mom of three, and I am so glad that you're here. This is a place where you can bring your real self, no matter what that looks like today, and be given the space, resources, and encouragement you need to set aside perfection and grow into the perfectly imperfect parent God made you to be. Looking for meaningful and fun additions to your Easter baskets this year? Christian Parenting has some amazing products just for you. And right now, you can get our Easter bundle for 15% off the regular price. This bundle includes three of our favorite products just for kids. Scripture affirmation cards, noteworthy prayers, and our devotional, My Time with God. These are some of our absolute favorite things at our house. My kids all love their devotional, and my son constantly asks me to put affirmation cards or noteworthy prayers in his backpack to find them when he's at school. This is a great way to incorporate more faith into the fun of Easter baskets. You can go to christianparenting.org slash store to get the Easter bundle at the 15% off discount. That's christianparenting.org slash store. All right, you guys, we have a really fun episode for you today. I am joined by Molly Stillman, and I know that you guys are going to love her. Molly is host of the Can I Laugh on Your Shoulder podcast. She's a mom, and she's the author of the book, If I Don't Laugh, I'll Cry, which is her memoir. Her story is so powerful, and she shares a little bit of it with us today. We talk about what her childhood was like, how she came to faith later in life, and what her parenting looks like now. We covered a lot of topics from imperfect parenting and apologizing to our kids when mistakes are made, to modeling a faith-filled life, to the important and difficult subject of finding a balance between sheltering our kids and exposing them to culture. Molly is funny, she's relatable, and I hope that you feel as though you are having a conversation with some friends today. Enjoy. Hi, Molly. Welcome to the Christian Parenting Podcast. Steph, I am honored to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy that you're here today. We're going to be talking about your book, If I Don't Laugh, I'll Cry. And I'm going to be honest that that's kind of where I'm at today. <laughs> I already told yeah. you before we started recording, like we're in the middle of a move. Yeah. Everything is everywhere. I don't know yeah. where anything is. My dog yeah. is at my feet about to have a panic attack probably. Like just things are a little bit crazy. And I literally am. I kind of am like, if I don't laugh at this situation, I probably will cry. Yeah. So I think yeah. everyone's it's- gone through that. It is a mantra I think that so many of us can relate to. <laughs> I mean, life just gets chaotic, right? Amen Good chaos to that. and bad chaos. It don't, it doesn't matter. Like it yeah. just it gets we can all relate to that. Yeah. Especially, phrase. you know, like your audience is primarily Christian parents <laughs> and all parents. We just it's the if if I don't laugh, I will cry is like basically how you get through parenthood. <laughs> oh my gosh. How many times even like <laughs> Sometimes like when your kids, when they need to be like disciplined or they do something just so absurd that you're like, I oh, yeah. can't even be upset with you because what you mm-hmm. did was just so insane. <laughs> like, yes. Yes. <laughs> I feel this on a deep, deep level. <laughs> it's partly why I named my book what I did. <laughs> I mean, that oh, makes man. sense. Yeah, it's so good. Okay. Well, speaking of parenting. Before we get more into your book, let's talk about your family because I want people to get yeah. to know you. So tell us who you are, tell us who your family is, and then describe your family in one word or phrase. Yes. Yeah, so um, I'm a wife to John and we've been married. We just celebrated 12 years of marriage and we have two kids here on earth, uh, Lily, who is 10 and Amos, who just turned eight. And we have two little boys in heaven, um, Elijah and Malachi. And we live on a small farm in Durham, North Carolina. So we raise chickens and goats and turkeys and ducks and geese and guinea fowl. And we have barn cats and farm dogs and old house dogs <laughs> and um, all of those things. And we try really hard to also grow food and, uh, you know, tree, have fruit trees and all of that. The goats have eaten most of that. Uh, <laughs> so if I'm being really honest, um, we've had to replace like a dozen fruit trees because the goats just eat them and destroy them. And I mean, you might be thinking, do, right? like, well, why don't you have the fruit, fruit trees protected? 
we have. <laughs> you clearly don't own goats. That goats are very determined individuals. And so when they see something that they want to eat, they will go through electrified wire. They will break fencing. They will jump over fences to get to it. They will, there could be, and, and okay, quick thing is like, people always told me, oh, when you get goats, like they will eat because we have poison ivy everywhere, all over our farm. And they're always like, oh, goats love poison ivy. Like they'll eat all the poison ivy. Not my goats. Not my goats. There's poison ivy everywhere, weeds everywhere. And they're like, mm, I think I should eat this ornamental flower. That is what they do. So, so they eat uh, everything you what, don't want them to eat. Yes. Yes. I finally just, we've lived here three years on this farm. And I am just at the point now where I have like resigned myself to the fact that I'm like, we're just not going to have pretty landscaping. And I'm okay with it. Like, we're just not going to have nice bushes. Uh, we're not going to have nice ornamental flowers. Like it's just, it's not going to happen. And so I've just, I've released it Steph to the Lord and it's fine. Listen, um, I live in the suburbs yeah. and my neighbor's yard is basically a golf course. She listens to this oh, podcast. Yeah. Karen, I love you. Your yard is so beautiful. And I apologize yeah. all the time that mine just doesn't look that way. So yeah. I've released dream. my landscaping too. And I don't live on a farm. Yeah. So some um, of us so are meant to do it. Yeah. So that's my, that's my, uh, my family and my, my, my family life is our days are, you know, full and busy with, uh, parenting and, and marriage. And, um, we also were involved in a, a church plant. And if anybody knows anything about church planting, that also is, uh, all consuming, but beautiful and, and brutal <laughs> is kind of the word. Um, yeah. And then, uh, you know, my, my, my day job, so to speak, even though it's not really like a traditional nine to five, um, is I have been in the kind of writing and content creation space for nearly 20 years. Um, I started blogging when I was in college. Um, and then I've been podcasting for seven and a half years at this point. And, uh, like you mentioned, yeah, my first book comes out, um, March 26th. And so it's just, uh, I'm really grateful. So that that's a little bit about my family. You gotta give us that one word. Oh, and our my one word, duh. So see, Steph, you got to rein me in. Um, one word to describe my family, I would say, is uh, joyful. Joyful. Just a joyful family. We love to laugh. Always laughing. Just find joy one. in all the things. Yeah. Yes. That's the first thing that comes to mind. Yeah. Everyone wants more joy. So I love that. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, and then my other question that I always ask everyone to get us started is, what is one thing you want every parent to know? One thing I want every parent to know is that it is not only good for you to make mistakes in your parenting journey, but it is necessary. And to quick be quick to apologize when you need to. And um, to learn from those mistakes in your parenting journey. That is something that I have learned a lot over the last couple of years. And I am really learning it as and I and I get it that like my oldest is 10. So I'm not, I'm not saying like I'm I don't have this all figured out, but um, uh, I am real quick to apologize to my kids when I screw up. And it's a lot. <laughs> so, <laughs> but in the end, like, you know, what do we want our own kids to do? Like, we want our own kids to make mistakes in the safety of, of home. Mm -hmm. And we want our kids to be quick to apologize. And we want our kids to be quick to, um, to learn and grow. So we have to model that ourselves as parents. Yeah, I think that's so important. Sometimes it's really hard because I'm very stubborn. I mean, I apologize all the time. Like, I, yeah. I think I apologize, like, too many times a day to count. But I'm also stubborn. So sometimes I want to be like, I am right here. Like, oh. <laughs> you know, it is a humbling thing. It, but it is Parenting so is the most it. humbling thing. Yes. Yeah. For sure. Okay. Let's shift to your book. Let's talk about it. You, it's a memoir. Like, mm -hmm. tell us a little bit, like, how did you get to this place that you decided, I'm going to write my story down and let yeah. the whole world read it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I know. Well, and it's, it's interesting because, you know, when, before we started recording, we were talking about how old we were and, um, you know, I'm, I'm 38 and, um, me too. A very quick, a very, uh, when people find out that I've written this book and they ask me like, what do you, you know, what's it about? And I'll say it's a memoir. 
I, the amount of people who have said, you're not old enough to write a mm-hmm. memoir. <laughs> and I, you know, in some ways I'm like, I get it. Like, I think that the, 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 the typical memoir we see is like written by somebody who's lived, you know, they're, they're in their fifties or sixties and they've lived this massive life and they're famous and all that kind of stuff. Like, and I don't claim to be any of that. Um, but I do say, you know, I've lived a whole lot of life in my first few decades and really what's actually kind of interesting is, is the book 80% of it takes place in like the first 25 years, <laughs> like really even maybe 90% of the book takes place in the first 25 years of my life. So um, there's not a whole lot in the book that really is like from the age of 25 to now. Um, and I did that very intentionally. And I think that, you know, this particular book and this particular piece of my story, and that really is at the end of the day, it's my testimony. Um, it's my story of not, of growing up, you know, not knowing the Lord, uh, growing up the daughter of a Vietnam veteran, uh, a woman Vietnam veteran, um, and, uh, the daughter of two recovering alcoholic Irish Catholics and, uh, you know, who had me later in life. And, um, and then my mom got sick with a chronic illness due to her exposure to Agent Orange. And, um, uh, and, you know, she battled that illness for eight years before she died my senior year of high school. And then, um, and, and then, uh, <laughs> as I like to say, hijinks ensue. <laughs> and so, um, you know, there's a lot to the story. There's a lot of layers. There's a lot of threads, um, that, uh, ultimately led me to, emotional, spiritual, financial, mental, emotional rock bottom, um, and to the feet of Jesus and where I surrendered my life to Christ at the age of 25 and, um, everything changed. And so that's what this book is. It's that story. Um, but at the end of the day, like my motivation for writing it, I mean, other than just, you know, surface level. I always wanted to write a book. My mom was a writer. My mom wrote her own memoir that was published in the early 80s. Um, And so I'm a writer by nature. I was a writing major in college. Like That's just how I've processed things over life. I love to write and I love the written word. I think it's really beautiful to paint with with words. And um, because I can't actually paint, like I... (laughs) figures with hair is like what I've got. Um, but, but I love, I love words and I love, um, writing. And so, you know, on a fundamental level, that was part of the motivation certainly. Um, but actually on a, on a more serious, uh, in a more serious way. And and it was, I felt God really specifically and unique, uniquely was calling me to this particular book and this particular story, because at the end of the day, um, while it is written through the lens of my story and my testimony, um, it is all of our stories. Um, it is the collective human experience where when we live long enough, when we have the ability to live long enough, we, um, all experience grief and joy and suffering and pain and loss and gain and heartache and success and, uh, mistakes and embarrassment and shame. I mean, we experience all of it, all all of it, all of that is part of the human emotion and, um, and the human experience. And so at the end of the day, like I really wanted readers to walk away you know, having laughed. Uh, I think the book is pretty funny. (laughs) Um, having cried, there are very, very dark, hard parts of the book. And then, um, having felt a little bit less alone in their own stories. And so wherever each individual person, um, that's reading it is in their own journeys, um, that they can close the book and they can see that their brokenness, um, can never is never too much for, to be redeemed by God. Um, that there's no situation that is too far gone. That there's um, no nothing that can't be forgiven. Um, and so it just really is some. That's my prayer and my hope um, for the book. And and by the grace of God, I, I think that that's that He's doing that. And so I'm really I'm so excited about it. I just uh, I, I'm so excited. Well, I'm excited to talk more about it and for people to get their hands on it because like I said, I did, I read it and I loved it. It was really mm-hmm. relatable. I think there's so much power in sharing our own stories because then it gives people permission to share their stories or maybe even just to process their stories if they yeah. haven't yet. And one of the things that I really appreciate about your story is that you didn't follow Jesus until later in life. It wasn't mm-hmm. like faith was absent in your childhood, but it wasn't your main thing. And I think sometimes as Christian parents, we get a little stuck on if we came to faith later in life, I was a little later in life. It feels like, oh, I kind of missed out on the childhood stuff or 
then we start to feel the pressure of like, I want to make sure my kids like always know and love Jesus. And, you know, like we put our hope in them starting mm. to follow Jesus when they're young, but there's everyone's story is different. God writes everybody's story. So tell us a little bit about that, like how faith wasn't really a part of your life. And then it was like, how did you actually come to faith? Yeah. So my, so like I mentioned, my parents were uh, recovering alcoholic Irish Catholics, <laughs> you know, and my dad was born in 1944. He was born the day before D-Day. Like he's going to wow. be 80 this year. So, you know, uh, he grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. He was one of five kids. He went to Catholic school most of his life. And, um, you know, just the reality was, is the culture that he was born into was, I mean, he was physically beaten by nuns. And so, and, and there was a lot that happened in his schooling, um, that messed him up pretty bad (laughs) so that would scar just about anyone, um, but really burnt him as far as the big C church. Um, and so my dad, uh, you know, became an alcoholic at a very young age, you know, when he was just in middle school, he started drinking and, um, that led him down a path of alcoholism and, um, he eventually got sober in July of 1979. And he hasn't, as of, you know, today he's got what, I don't know, math is hard, like almost math is so know, hard. 40, 45 years of sobriety, um, which is, uh, pretty, you know, pretty amazing. And, um, he still attends AA meetings, you know, multiple times a week. Um, but I think, and then, and then my mom had a similar upbringing. Um, she was born and raised outside of DC and she was one of five Irish Catholic family. She went to Catholic school. She was beaten by nuns. Like, I mean, it's like almost the exact same story. Um, but then, you know, she went to nursing school. She went to Catholic nursing school. Um, and then she enlisted in the army nurse corps and went to Vietnam and, when she got home, she, like many other veterans and especially women veterans at the time, like she came home with a good old classic case of alcoholism and PTSD and depression. And, um, and also like, you know, she, she was really angry with God for a really long time because Vietnam, uh, was terrible, <laughs> was terrible. It's just the, I mean, there's a whole, that's a whole nother layer to all of this. Um, and so not only was she jaded by the big C church, um, but she was jaded with God in general. Um, And she got sober in 1983. And and like my dad, um, AA kind of became her church community. And for people that aren't really familiar with Alcoholics Anonymous, I mean, it was created by Christians. So it's actually like it's entire fundamental, like foundational principles are all Christian values. Um, And so for a lot of people of that era, that dealt with similar (laughs) issues, you know, for right or wrong. Um, that was, that was AA becomes their church community and, and functions in that way. And, um, and I mean, for people that, you know, might not know, like they say the Lord's prayer at the end of every single meeting. I mean, the serenity prayer, like prayer is a huge piece of it and surrendering to a, you know, AA refers to it as a higher power. Like that is a huge, huge piece of it. So spirituality is a massive, massive piece of, of the recovery community and, and process. And so, um, when my parents had me, my dad was 41. My mom was like almost 38 or something. Maybe she was 38. Um, you know, having me later in life and having the view of the church that they had, they just didn't feel like they, they could what in their words, force religion on me. Like it just wasn't their, uh, MO so to speak. And so they kind of just let me figure it out along the way. And so, um, I actually have a chapter in the book that was one of my favorite chapters to write called doubting Thomas. And it's really, my my experience with church and faith prior to coming to know him. And, you know, I mean, I had heard of Jesus, but it was like in my mind, it was the Sunday school, Mel Gibson, flowy haired Jesus, like portrait <laughs> on the wall. And, um, but, you know, I didn't know what the gospel was. Um, and my first real, real significant memory and interaction with the church was actually in elementary school. And I had a, a best friend, uh, that we had we become best friends in second grade. And she was in a really, really strong Christian home, strong Christian parents and um, just, you know, upright, righteous people, beautiful people. And I would spend the night and we would do devotionals and all that kind of stuff. And um, she started inviting me to Awana. 
And, uh, you know, if people don't know what Awama is, like it's it's basically like Cub Scouts, Girl Scouts, but like for Baptists, <laughs> and, like you go and like you memorize scripture and then you earn patches. And I liked my friend and I liked earning patches. And so I went to Awana with her sometimes. And um, but again, like I didn't know what the gospel was. I didn't know what I, I didn't know what John 316 meant, even though I had memorized it. Like it just it's just no, no real concept of it. And then in fifth grade, we were having a PE day where we were inside because it was raining and my friend had come up to me and she was like, hey, Molly, we need to talk. And even in fifth grade, like that phrase, we need to mm. talk, like was just, okay, what's, what's going on? And so we go into this little side room and she looks at me and she says, I can't be friends with you anymore. And I was so confused in the moment. I said, what do you, what do you mean? You can't be friends with me. And she said, you're not Christian enough for me. Mm. And I, I mean, that that's just word for word verbatim. Like, this is not a summary. This is exactly what she said. You're not Christian enough for me. And I, in that moment, was so confused. And, and she basically reiterated, like, we can't be friends anymore. And she got up and she walked out. And I kid you not, Steph, like, that's essentially the last time we ever had a conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is a girl that I did everything with. And so... To have that like be like broken up with by my best friend was an incredibly formative experience. And so I walk out of that room like, well, if this is what Christians are like, like, I don't want anything to do with that. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so that stuck with me. Um, and so then anytime I I had friends like through middle school and high school that were Christians, like I just was always a little bit like arm's length. Um and there's obviously a whole lot more layers to that. Um, but I just, I, I just kept the church. I kept Jesus. I kept all of it away because it was just, I, I didn't want to put myself in a position to get hurt again um, because I didn't have a fundamental understanding of what the gospel really was. And then, uh, and then when my mom died, my senior year of high school, I was just mad. I was mad at God. Any understanding I had of God at that point, um, was called into question and going, how could this good, you know, God of the universe, who's like up on a throne, just like let my mother, who was like one of the best people I've ever known. Um, how could she just die? Like I saw her pray. I saw her do these things. Like I saw her, uh, like her life was so hard from the time. Like she was a teenager, just her life was hard. And it just made me mad. And um, and so that began a process of really just wrestling with any lack, like any faith at all. And so, you know, I eventually, a few years later, like I found myself not just, I wouldn't even say agnostic. I would have said I was atheist, like not just, you know, anti-Christ, just like, I mean, just made fun of people who believed in God, made fun of people who believed in Jesus. I really, really struggled. Um And so that was, you know, that began, my mom died in 2002. Um, I graduated college in 2007. um, And I just was on this journey of just trying to do all of life on my own. I was trying to pick myself up by my own bootstraps. And I was trying to, you know, uh, do everything in in my own strength and my own power. And what happened was I ended up uh, in rock bottom. And I, you know, emotional, spiritual, uh, financial, like I said earlier, uh, rock bottom. And when you get to a point, and, and there's obviously a whole lot that that led to that moment, but when you get to that moment where you are the mo- you are in the darkest place, where I, I was living alone, I was suicidal, and I was not just like depressed. I mean, just in a really, really dark mental space. And when you're when you're in that place, you kind of get to a point where you're like. This cause this is gonna go one of two ways. Like I gotta either get help or it's gonna end in an irreversible decision. And um, and ultimately, like uh I had tried a lot of things and um at the time I was kind of loosely seeing, we'll say hanging out with a guy <laughs> I worked with. I didn't want a relationship though, but he was a Christian. And there was something about him that was different. He had this security and this steadfastness about himself that was just, uh, was intriguing. And I, there was something about it. And, 
you know, at the time it didn't make sense, but I look back now and really it was the call of the Holy Spirit that just said, ask him if you can go to church, (laughs) which like looking back, like made no sense whatsoever. And so I said, can I go to church with you? And he said, yes. And I immediately regretted asking that question. I was terrified. Like when he came to pick me up for church, like I just, I said nothing in the car. I was terrified. I was like, this is a mistake. Why, what was I thinking? Um, and the reality was, is that I walked into that church and I heard the gospel for the very first time. Like I heard the actual gospel that there was a God in heaven who sent his own son down to earth to die on a cross for my sins. And that if I turn my life over to him, that I can be forgiven, I can be redeemed. And when you are in a place where you have lacked hope for a really long time and you hear the possibility of hope, like there's a light at the end of the tunnel, that's life changing. And so for me, it wasn't a like, I didn't raise my hand and surrender my life like in that moment. But what I did do was I walked out of that building with a glimmer of hope and I started coming every Sunday after that. And then it just began that slow, painful process of sanctification and and unclenching my fists and surrendering um, everything over to him and, and the rest is history. All right, you guys, I have an exciting code for you today from one of my absolute favorite websites. HomeThreads has quickly become one of my favorite places to shop for my house. At HomeThreads.com, you will discover furniture designed with the values of Christian parenting in mind. From prayerful spaces to family-friendly comfort, their pieces are crafted to nurture your children's hearts and souls, all while giving you the best value. I recently got an amazing bakeware set that I absolutely love. There are so many products available, you're definitely going to find anything you need to make your home both functional and cozy. You can visit homethreads.com slash cppodcast today and get your code for 15% off your order. Raising a family with faith should be reflected in every corner of your home. Home Threads, love where you live. I think what's so interesting about that story is so you start with your parents and they experienced like literal hurt in the church. Right. right. And then like physical hurt. And yeah. then in your upbringing, like you had a friend who really hurt you right? in the name of Jesus. And so that was hurt too. And I think all of us have been hurt in some way, shape, or form in a church community setting Mm -hmm. to various degrees. And then we also all experience painful things. Like you experienced the loss of your mom and watching her struggle before she passed away. And like, I just think there's so much of life that's hard and it's easy to lose hope. Mm -hmm. So as you guys are raising your kids, like how are you doing things a little bit differently to, you can't protect them from the hurt. (laughs) You can't Mm -mm. protect them from pain, but you can raise them in hope. You can raise them in a church and you can encourage them to be welcoming, inclusive Mm -hmm. Christians who love others and don't hurt others. So how have you kind of, how all this changed your parenting priorities and raising your kids now? Well, that's a great question. I love that because that's that's something that my my husband and I talk a lot about because he and I grew up, you know, in vastly different environments. Like my husband grew up, you know, Southern Baptist, his parents, you know, his dad has pretty much anytime he's on the deacon board, he's chairman of the deacons. Like his, you know, my husband's missed like five Sundays of church his entire life. Like just uh you know, came, saw, bought the t-shirt, like just (laughs) like that's, you know, and so then I had such a just wildly different, um, upbringing. And so it's interesting to, to mesh our respective upbringings, you know, and especially like my husband even kind of, he, he talks about like, he didn't grow up in a legalistic home, but it was certainly very strict. Um, he's like, you know, nineties subculture, like he just didn't experience any of it. Like, you know, and he was listening to DT, DC talk like that was it. You know, he wasn't listening to the music of, of the 90s and all of that. And then I grew up in this like non-Christian home and the daughter of an Irish rec- alcoholic rec- Irish Catholics. And one of them was a veteran. Let's just say that <laughs> language wasn't exactly like filtered a whole lot in my house. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. like two kind of ends of the spectrum, but I wasn't allowed to watch Power Rangers or The Simpsons. So like it was, you know, there was still like there was boundaries <laughs> and rules and all of that. Um, And so my husband and I have brought that our own uh, upbringings and kind of the let's keep these things that our parents did well and let's do these things differently that our parents maybe could have done differently. And and how do we bring that to our own parenting? And so there's, there's 
all that to say, there's sort of two pieces to this. And the first is in my own experience with, you know, that formative experience with my best friend. That is something that I've been really, really intentional with my kids. Like, yes, you know, my, my daughter, especially like she, her two best friends are Christians. Um, but she does have friends from school who are not. And so, we talk a lot about the kind of language we use around our faith and um, and and the type of people that we are around. And so, of course, I want my kids to be friends with people who think and look differently than them. And they are. Um, and so it's a matter of we have conversations about, like, how do you, like, share Jesus with these kids that you're friends with, but not in a way that is going to push them away? Um, And creating opportunities, too, to, like, invite them to different things. You know, so there's, like, a church event just saying, like, hey, you know, invite your friends or something like that. Um, And then the other thing, too, is, is, but then also being wise and discerning in that we are really careful as to whose houses our kids go to. Um, And so if we don't really know the parents, if we don't really know, like, what's happening at those homes, like, we're pretty guarded as far as whose houses those kids go to. Um, and I understand that that's not every parent's decision. And so that because of that, our home are, is always open. Like our kids' friends can come over anytime, um, you know, within reason, uh, <laughs> you know. Um, and and so that's something that's important too, is like when our, when our kids have their friends over, especially the ones that don't know Christ, like, you know, we don't shy away from talking about you know, our, our faith at, at dinner or praying before a meal or, um, you know, doing a devotional before a sleepover or something like that. You know, it's not, and it's not like preachy. It's not over the top. It's just, um, it, it's just in, in how we live our life, you know, in front of, of others. Um, so there's that piece to it. Um, and then as far as like, uh, kind of what I was saying at the beginning about, being really quick to apologize, being really quick to ask for forgiveness. Um, We just try to model that with our kids and and pointing them back to Jesus that like, as parents, like we are going to fail our kids. That's a really hard thing to come to grips with, understanding that as a mother, as a father, I am going to fail my kids. My husband is going to fail his kids. We are going to be imperfect parents. Like, um, I remember participating a couple a uh, couple years in the perfectly imperfect parenting conference online, and I loved it so much because that is that is our our journey as parents. That is our journey as as Christians, as and especially raising up the next generation of believers. Um, is is helping our kids see that that I am not perfect. I do not claim to be perfect. But at the end of the day, I'm going to keep pointing them back to the parent who is perfect, Mm -hmm. who isn't going to let them down, who isn't going to screw up. Um, And so, uh, you know, we try to do that. We do it imperfectly. (laughs) Um, But, you know, when it comes to discipline, like we had, you know, we we try to uh, if there's if there's sign, you know, times when um, we have to, you know, use even a Bible story as like, Hey, this is going to be kind of our rubric for how we discipline in this situation. Mm -hmm. And, but we, again, we don't do it in a like judgmental or condemning way. We do it in a, like, here's what God says about this. Like you lied to us. Like lying is pretty significant in our household. Like we are, we are not, we're very low on the tolerance of lying. Um, and so how does that, you know, or stealing, how do, how do we, you know, pay back what we took from our brother or our sister or, or you know, things like that. So I, I think yeah. that's what it is. It's, it's at the end of the day, being quick to apologize, being quick to say, I screwed this up. I am not perfect, but your heavenly father is. And so he is the standard. I am not. <laughs> that's the key. Amen. Okay. So coming together from two vastly different households to parent kids. Those are the good things. What's been like the hard part about that? Hmm. Oh, I think our current struggle, I'd say that, you know, it varies. Um, I'd say our current struggle is balancing. Um, Cause like I said, you know, my husband was, was not in a, uh, legalistic household, but it was a strict household. Mm -hmm. And then my parents were strict in just other random weird ways, but I wasn't necessarily like shielded from culture or shielded from language, things like that. So 
finding the happy medium of how do we, especially in today's day and age, um, shield, protect our kids from culture while also like not completely locking them out of it. Right. Um, which is a really hard balance to strike, and I don't have a perfect answer for it. Um, if you figure it out, will you let me know? <laughs> I know. It's the, it's the um, you know, I think it, it's things like, uh, you know, there are so many controversial things as far as like, what do we let our kids watch? And what music do we let them listen to? And, um, and I think it's striking a, hi- a healthy balance. Like I said, my husband wasn't allowed to watch any movie from the 90s that was not like, you know, whatever. He wasn't around, around, allowed to read any book unless it was like the Left Behind series, you know, <laughs> like he listened to DC Talk and like um, where we, both my husband and I serve on our worship team. We are a very musical family. So like we listen to a lot of worship music in our house, but we're also big country music fans. My daughter loves Taylor Swift. Like, and I understand that that's a very controversial thing right now. Like there are a lot of Christian parents that are like, you're a terrible Christian parent for letting your daughter listen to Taylor Swift. And it's hard because I was in college when Taylor Swift's debut album came out and I bought that debut Teardrops album and I know guitar. every single word, like Mary's song. And like, I'm a, so like, I love Taylor Swift too. Um, so it's a balance, you know what I mean? And so finally yeah. what I decided was what, what I felt comfortable with was I created a Taylor Swift playlist on Spotify and then all of her current songs that have language in them. I just put the clean versions on there. And so yeah. my daughter knows the words to the ta- all the Taylor Swift songs, but they're all the clean versions. And so that was what, at the end of the day, we felt comfortable with. Yeah. But she also loves worship music. So I think it's a having a healthy balance and help helping our kids understand that like, we are not to idolize Taylor Swift, but we can also really enjoy her music and like not look to her for spiritual guidance. Right. You know what I mean? And so yeah. I, under, but I understand that that's a controversial opinion. There's going to be some people that think that that's like terrible. Um, yeah. And so, you know, and then as far as books, like we're pretty, I, I want my kids reading, but I'm going to be careful as to like what they're reading. I want to monitor it. Like my, my mm-hmm. kids especially are into graphic novels. And if you don't know, like there's a lot of graphic novels out there that are disguised as tween novels that have graphic stuff in there. Yeah. And so yeah. I preview everything to make sure that what they're reading is like, yes, my husband, my son loves Captain Underpants and it's a whole lot of poop and fart jokes. And it's just like, he's eight. And so it's like, whatever. I'm that's just, that's not do. a battle that I'm yeah. going to fight. And so, but I think that that's the thing that, uh, you know, whereas like my husband wasn't allowed to watch any of that stuff as a kid, but like it's a balance. So we're, we're, we're doing it imperfectly. And I just, I share all this for the parent, especially that is listening, that is like, how do you strike this balance? And the mm-hmm. end of the day is, where no one is going to have it figured out perfectly. And we have to teach our kids to be in the world, but not of the world, but not also completely shield them from the things of this world. Now, the one thing we have put down real hard and is we are not budging is our kids are not getting phones. They are not mm-hmm. getting phones. They will not have social media. Absolutely not. Hard pass. And I've been telling my kids that since they were like three. Yeah. I've been like, don't even ask because the answer is going to be no. Um, and my daughter, especially like she's a lot of her friends already in fourth grade have phones yeah. and a couple of them have TikTok. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, absolutely not. And that is one of those things I will not budge on and I will protect my kids as long as I can. So yeah, we have the non-negotiables, the phone, social media, unlimited access to the Internet, non-negotiable. Absolutely not. As far as the music, what they watch, we're a little bit more case by case basis as far as yeah. that goes. That's how we are too. Cause I do, I think it's so important to strike a balance. And like if you're too sheltered, you go and you go into shell shock when you actually get into the real world. Cause the reality is our kids aren't gonna live in our houses forever. Right. I mean, that's it, the goal, right? <laughs> but like you have they're to gonna teach move kids on. discernment. Yeah. You yeah. do from an early age. And so that's that's one of the things is we invite them into the conversation when there is something that we won't let them watch or we won't less, let them listen to. We talk about why. Yeah. Um, that just because something might be fine, like, is it right or is it good? Yeah. Um, and again, like I said, I, I and I understand that there's going to be parents listening that are going to have wildly different opinions. And I think we all come to it. And when you know your kids best. And every family is going to look different. Yeah. 
and you might not agree with your spouse and then so we have to figure out together, you know, like that's the hard part. But I think that what you're saying that's really wise is that when you make a decision, you explain the why to your kids and yes. don't just sit on the, because I said so, or because I'm your parent and I set the rules, yes. like explaining it to them yes. is then so much easier to be like, this is why it's not good for you. Like we have yeah. a, we're starting with YouTube. So we've had a lot of conversations yeah. Oh, yeah. about why YouTube isn't good right. for their brains. And we just talked about it at dinner last night and they finally were starting to click where they're like, oh, I understand right. 15 million conversations later <laughs> why yes. what you're saying makes sense. So yes. I think that's really wise to yeah. encourage the why. Again, I think it's it's helping our kids, inviting them into the conversation about, yeah. you know, they're going to go out. Like my kids ride the school bus. It ain't the first time they've heard these words. Like they hear the these words. Bus. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. My kids mm -hmm. ride the school bus. They yeah. hear it. Let me tell yes. you. I had a whole fun conversation with my kids one day when my daughter came home and was like asking me what a particular word was. And uh, I was like, well, I guess we're having that conversation now. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So and you just have to we've created an environment where we are we have told our kids you are safe here. And he, like, I want you to come to us and ask the question before you go to Google. Yes. And that is the environment we've created. And so our kids have asked us some incredibly awkward, hard conversations or mm -hmm. questions that I've looked at my husband and go, well, all right. But we never, ever make them feel bad about asking that question. And we don't let our own like uncomfortability. That's not the word. That's not, that's not a word. We discomfort. don't let our <laughs> discomfort. That's it. <laughs> Steph. <laughs> I just I wrote a book, y'all, and I just made up a word. But we don't let our own discomfort show in those moments. I, I mm -hmm. sit with it for a moment and I go, okay, so that question just got asked. And I go, I'm so glad that you asked that question. And thank you so much for coming to me when you asked that question. Let's have a conversation about it together. And so I tell you, I kid you not, Steph, this is like uh, your listeners are really learning a lot about my, the insides of my parenting um, with all. <laughs> I mean, that's the goal here. <laughs> but I had I had a whole conversation one night where, like I said, my, my daughter had come home. She'd asked me about something she heard on the bus. And I was like, well, that is a great thing to ask me about and not Google. And so I said to her or then she had a follow up question. Well, how do I know what words are bad words? Mm -hmm. And so I. Whether this was the right thing to do or not, I was like, well, I guess we're just going to go down the list. And so I just proceed to tell her what all the bad words are and what all they mean. <laughs> and it was like, this was, I, I remember coming downstairs after putting her to bed. We had this conversation. I look at my husband and I was like, I need a moment because that was not anything that I was equipped to handle. But I, by the grace of God, I, I got through it. And that, in a lot of ways helped equip her equip her to know what these words were mm -hmm. what they meant why we don't use them things like that um and yeah. so that was you know like i said i did it imperfectly but it Perfectly also made makes for a fun story <laughs> i we tell our kids words only have power if you give them power amen and so like if you hear a word that you like 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 just don't give that word power and move right. on. Like, right. though, you know what words are bad. Just don't, like, people are trying to, like, make a scene or make a statement by using them, and you don't have to do that. But right. Yeah. Those are the fun moments of parenting. Where you say, if I don't laugh, I'll go. <laughs> if I don't laugh. <laughs> okay. This was wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. Can you, before you go, just tell everyone where they can connect with you and get yeah. a copy of your book? Absolutely. So um, I'm at still being Molly on Instagram and Facebook and wherever you get your socials and still being Molly.com is my website. Um, my podcast is called Can I Laugh on Your Shoulder? And it comes out every Wednesday. And um, and yeah, my book is called If I Don't Laugh, I'll Cry. How Death, Debt and Comedy Led to a Life of Far Faith Farming and Forgetting What I Came Into This Room For. And uh, you can get it wherever books are sold. Uh, and if you love the sound of my vocal cords, I do read the audiobook. Um, mm -hmm. And it was really fun uh, to do the audiobook. I sing in it. I do character voices. I do all kinds of stuff in it. So that was a blast. Um, and I just would be so grateful if you would pick up a copy and share it with somebody if it, if it helps you a little bit in your own journey. Yeah. We'll put it in show notes too. So it's super easy for people. Thank you so much, Steph. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for being on.
Thank you so much for joining us. I love what Molly said about having faith-filled conversations with our kids and creating an environment where they feel safe to have tough conversations with us. It's so much easier said than done, but it's definitely important. I hope that you have a wonderful week. Thank you so much for listening. May God bless you. May you know that he has been in your life every step of the way. From the very beginning up until now, he is writing your story and he has great plans for you. And his grace is always enough for you. Thank you so much for listening to the Christian Parenting Podcast. Make sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And if you love this podcast, would you please consider leaving a review and sharing it with a friend? This is the best way to reach more people and encourage even more parents. Christian Parenting is a donor-funded ministry, and we rely on friends like you to keep podcasts like this going. So to find out more about Christian Parenting and to make a donation, head over to christianparenting.org or at christianparenting underscore org on Instagram. Thank you again. See you next week.